So the first, before I begin my discussion, I was totally engaged with the first two speakers. And uh, I think what I'd like to do is maybe, through my presentation, attempt to answer some of Mark's questions, possibly. Serendipity, OK? And first, i uh, offer a counter uh, position to some of Jen's uh, thoughts about how we get uh, technology to the market. And I know I'm going to be off the microphone for a second, so excuse me. So that's, that's the classic market diffusion curve you always see. And then Jen presents how you move across that and get your passive house into the market with the first strategy, which is more of a market-based strategy. Uh, there's a second strategy, which is the big stick, of course, where you go and have a lot of institutional requirements or codes force the improvement in building performance in the marketplace by mandate. So the, the issue with this, though, is this. Right there at the bottom, there's a schism, or a, uh, almost like a big drop. Uh, I, I love the work done by Geoffrey Moore in the book Inside the Tornado. I think a lot of others have picked up on the theory. But it, what it recognizes so critically is that as you're trying to get new innovation into the marketplace, there is an amazing, complete, radical difference between the early adopter and that mainstream user that gets you on the steep slope, the exponential growth part of the diffusion curve. And unfortunately, there's no remotely similar characteristics between the early adopter and the mainstream user, where the early adopter is willing to compromise on hassle factor, on maybe things don't work always the way they should be, on having to learn the new technology, on having to put up with some of the early glitches. I can go on and on. The mainstream user couldn't be more opposite. They expect when they buy products, they work easy, there's no hassle, it's always the way it's uh, predicted to perform. And to cross over early adopters or the geeks, as Mark refers to us, uh, to the mainstream folks, there's that big cliff. And uh, unless you cross it with the right strategies, this one, there it is, you're kind of stuck. And if I were to draw the, let's say, the market curve for technologies like geothermal uh, systems and residential or structural insulated panels, it looked like this. <laughs> they essentially flatline once they get to the cliff. So you find geothermal systems are stuck at 2% market penetration. Structural insulated panels are stuck at 2% market penetration. This is over 20, 30, 40 years. So um, if you are interested in going to Geoffrey Moore's thesis, which I think is great, the way that you get past the cliff is essentially you need what he calls the bowling alley strategy. Imagine all the pins stacked up like a bowling lane. Each row of the pins is a, a, a key segment, and there's an application within each market segment. And what you have to do is you have to find a way to fight effectively the 800-pound gorilla. So by example, let's say I'm trying to get a new database into the market, and the 800-pound gorilla might be, let's say, Oracle, as an example. How do I compete as a new technology, a new innovation with Oracle? The bowling alley strategy would submit that what you need to do is attack one market segment, application by app application, and own it. So let's say that for schools, you'll be the database of choice. You choose that as your segment. And you, you come up with a database that's completely configured for that user. It does grading. It does attendance. It does uh, reporting. It does all sorts of other factors you need to do in a school environment for small schools. And it goes to high schools. And it does colleges and universities. And you move through and wind up being the database of choice for that segment because you've addressed that user with an absolute, perfectly designed, tailored solution. Then you may go to hospitals and medical field and have for small hospitals. You do billing and you do reporting. You keep track of records for patients and so forth. And your database is already configured to do everything they want to do. And you own that market segment, the next segment. And eventually what you are is you're seen as a credible player in the marketplace and you gain market share. And that's the bowling alley strategy. So, 
Uh, you heard my background, and one of my major accomplishments is probably working with the Energy Star for Homes program. And what we've done with that program uh, up to the time I left a few months ago is we grew it from virtually nothing to about 30% market share in 1.3 million homes over the 16, 17 years that we had that label. And the reason why we were successful is we attacked that schism with an incredibly obsessive focus on how do we get those segments in the marketplace. And so when we first started Energy Star, we were a national program, but we were really only in a few markets where we knew we had critical HERS infrastructure. And so we were very, very prominent very quickly in Las Vegas and Phoenix and a um, number of Texas markets and so forth. And then we went after utility program markets. And then we went after uh, factory-made housing. And then we went after um, a number of other segments. But the way we grew was effectively unknown to ourselves because we were not aware of the strategy doing it pretty well. And then we grew this program. And so just as a word of caution is, I don't think that you passive house will be necessarily growing automatically to that steep part of the diffusion curve just by humming along. Eventually, you're going to have to figure out how you get to that next wave of mainstream homeowners who will buy passive houses and not be you and I and the early folks who just get it. And you got that big, you have that big schism or cliff there that's going to hit you in the face. And if you don't come up with a strategy to get past, a very similar like bowling alley strategy, then you run into troubles and you might look like the SIPs and the geothermal market share. And that's a big, big thing you have to realize. So I just offer that alternative opinion, take it for what it's worth. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention about Energy Star, though, that's it's interesting, it, it, before I go into my core presentation, is how what we've done is so similar to Passive House. Now, if you look at the green programs, for instance, could you convolute something more effectively than they have? You virtually have four tiers of grades or shades of green and then you have these scoring systems that are so complicated and have all these different components that everyone's pretty confused about what's going on, where in Passive House and Energy Star, what it was, either you are Passive House or you're not, and this is what we stand for, and you have a very clear message. And I thought we did too. Now, what was interesting, though, about Energy Star that's different from Passive House was how we got to the market. We sat at the very beginning with a blank page and we said, what are we going to do? And there were these very, very substantial, comprehensive EBA criteria. EBA is the Energy and Environmental Building Association. Back when we started, it was actually the Energy Efficient Building Association. And we had other criteria that told us everything we should do for a comprehensive, high-performance home. We knew what to do day one in 1994, November, when I got there, 1995, as we developed our spec. We knew what to do but we didn't do it. What we did that was different from Passive House is we said, okay, we, here's our aspiration of what we would like to be when we grow up, but this is how we grow up. We actually go to the market in gradations of rigor and bring the industry along piece by piece. I don't know if one's better than the other, but that was a strategy we took that was very different. You're coming in right away with the aspirational goal saying this is our way or the highway we came in and we said, very first generation one, Energy Star, all you had to do in 1996, when we really officially kind of got rolling, was you did only 0.35 air changes natural, which is what, about eight or nine or 10 ACH 50. Um, you did tight ducts, because ducts were leaking like a sieve. You put better windows, and the rest of the stuff kind of met code, maybe a little bit more efficient equipment. That was the spec. I may look back and I cringe at what Energy Star was version one. It, it was a, it was, and, and, we, and we, we saw evidence of that because there were consumer complaints and issues that would crop up. But what that entry point did for us on our growth up to 30% market share was it gave us an entree to the building community to earn their confidence, to show them why going at that time 30% above code was, made sense from a business perspective, technically how it could be done. We became kind of a trusted partner with the industry. It took us to 2006 when there was enough pressure from codes. We finally got some traction. We finally got the HERS home energy rating system, industry infrastructure developing that we kind of took it to the next level. And 2006, 
The next level meant we added air barriers in the uh, insulated assemblies, uh, attic walls and foundations, and there were some sizing requirements and some slight ad adjustments on what is the baseline for insulation and for windows and so forth. But essentially, we, we just added a modicum of building science, far from complete though, and that's version two up to today, and starting next July, we go to version three. I say we, uh, the program does. And with version three, we kind of get to our aspirational goal, which was complete building science. Every Energy Star qualified home, starting next July, will have a complete insulation system. What that means is the insulation will meet or exceed the 2009 IECC, substantially below passive house, but also it will be installed properly. You will have complete air barriers. You have minimum thermal bridging. And the air sealing all throughout the structure will be much, much tighter than even the original Energy Star. On top of that, there'll be at least a code or Energy Star window in the home, and plus general air sealing throughout the house. So you have a what I think will be a thermal defect-free thermal enclosure. Now, if you, what that means is it's not nearly what Passive House is, but if I go and do my infrared diagnostics and shoot an Energy Star home, it will look pretty much thermal defect free. One of my favorite images I have right now is working with Garbett Homes out in Salt Lake City. They are one of the most motivated builders I've had the pleasure to work with. And there they are in the middle of a project humming along with Energy Star version two. And they're so enthusiastic, even though they're in the middle of the project, they flip their spec. And so they hit one home stop and go version three and start building version three. Then they come back in the winter and took infrared camera image of that row of homes. And you have version two just with glaring thermal defects just of heat leaving the house side by side with thermal defect free perfect homes right next to them. It's just incredible what the difference it makes. So we finally grew up as a program. And so that's the background I come from. Now I'm, now I'm at DOE. Okay, I'm a happy fellow. I'm at DOE doing a whole bunch of new stuff. And here's my new world. Uh, my world, first of all, involves a lot of research. Now, there's the uh, Building America program, which is basically developing new innovations for ultra-low energy homes. Uh, we work with the national labs who contribute. We have emerging technology programs. CRADAs are cooperative research and development agreements. On top of that, we have a number of deployment activities. Um, I have a resource tool I'm developing right now that's brand new. That will, from your lap, uh, from your iPad, from your smartphone, or if you want to use a normal website, you'll be able to access any detail on any aspect of high-performance homes, from thermal enclosures to efficient equipment to renewable energy-ready construction to disaster resistance to water protection to even how you do uh, diagnostics in the field. You'll pull up any information you need that includes scopes of work. Uh, they'll include. Um, diagrams and uh, graphic depictions of the measure. We'll have side-by-side -side images of how to install correctly and incorrectly that measure. Uh, you'll pull up information that has the CAD drawing so you can drop it into your construction documents. Uh, if you need to build a case for uh, helping a decision maker move to that level of performance, you can line up as many case studies as you need for that climate, for that type of housing with those uh, specific measures. And you'll also have access, if you're a geek like us, to all the full detailed research reports, all from your smartphone or iPad for any measure that gets you to a net zero level performance house. So the resource tools are an amazing asset. And it's, it's just combining all the content that we have in our shop, that we developed at uh, Energy Star, that we have outside contributors bringing forward. So it'd be an amazing, amazing resource for builders, contractors, educators, for PERS raters, for building science professionals, for anyone who needs any content how to get to an ultra low energy consuming house. And then we have a better buildings programs that works with communities to develop better deployment strategies for getting retrofits in the marketplace. Workforce guidelines are essentially a massive amount of scopes of work for how you do retrofits. And hopefully most of you know about the solar decathlon. Show of hands, most of you know? Yeah, it's, well, of course, Maryland won this year, so uh, that's a big deal. But it's an amazing program that stimulates the students in this and other countries all over the, the world 
to just bring forward innovation in how to do absolutely net zero types of uh, homes, and it, it's an amazing program. And then we have the labeling programs. We have Builders Challenge, which is going to be the focus of what I talk about today. Home Performance with Energy Star is basically a solution for getting whole house retrofits into the marketplace. Energy Star is a label as for new homes and products. And then there's the Home Energy Score, which is our new kind of asset score for your house that's an existing home. And I won't go into any of these in detail, but I want to give you the depth and breadth of my world that I come from. And then we have to think about how to get better and add more. Oop. Hopefully I'm still good with the recording process. Uh, how to get better with addressing the transaction process. What's really frustrating is we're doing amazing things and appraisers could care less. Lenders price their product, mortgages, as if there's no difference in risk to them, the lender, with a loan for a horrible house that's the worst home allowed by law, which is, you know is a code home, versus a high performance net zero type of home. Can you imagine that? No risk difference for those homes. Water protection, durability, maintenance, future value, ability to homeowners to afford to live in those homes, and they're the same risk from a lender. You price a mortgage the same for a, a, a code home and a, a, a low energy home, it, that's astounding. And the same thing for insurance. Why are insurance rates the same for these incredible passive homes and low energy homes and a minimum code home. All the protections that are in those homes, it, it just doesn't make sense. And we're also concerned with the sales infrastructure. I personally, as the National Director for Energy Star for Homes, must have done uh, mystery shopping at homes all across, home subdivisions all across this country, tens of thousands of homes worth. And it is a sad state of sad skill, sales skills that we have in the marketplace for, for presenting to consumers the value of what you and I are doing. It just doesn't happen. I do eight hour training classes just on sales for yucks, just to try and bring forward some of the amazing uh, skills and um, ways of presenting the compelling reasons why we should buy these homes to people who work in the real estate industry. It's just in incredible. So these are on our ra radar screen. And then the code process is sitting there right at uh, DOE as well, because we actually contribute to that as well. And you have all the code going down uh, from 2009 to 2015. You won't believe the revolt on our hand, on our hands right now for 2012. And, uh, and then there are net zero codes around the country we have to be attuned to as well. So that's my world. And I'm going to talk quickly today I mean, this is what I focus on in those green boxes, the Building America Resource Tool, Builders Challenge, and Appraisal. That's where I'm spending most of my time. But I want to show you this one more piece of my world, which is how I'm trying to fit and understand how all these parts go together. Go together. And essentially, Building America is, is developing and feeding the innovations. And it goes either straight sometimes to Energy Star or first to the Builder Challenge, which is a higher rigor specification in Energy Star, and then Builder Challenge feeds Energy Star because we almost wind up with Builder Challenge being a farm system, if you will, for Energy Star. We, we have the innovations come out of Building America, and if they are ready for prime time, Builder Challenge will put them into criteria that become part of that label. Builder Challenge proves that they can be done with production and regular builders across the country, and then Energy Star adopts a lot of what happens with Builder's Challenge as its core specification. And then when Energy Star is successful, it goes straight to the codes. And that's how things are kind of progressing. So if any of you look at the IECC 2009, you will notice there's a complete set of requirements for, uh, for air barriers. It's a direct copy from the Energy Star version 2 thermal bypass checklist. And we're very proud of that. And we know it got there because Energy Star proved that that was a very important piece. So that's the world I'm in. And what's missing is any link to passive house. It, right now, there's no link to passive house. So I'll, I want to figure today maybe some, uh, or make some suggestions today how to make that link, which will be the rest of my presentation. So to begin explaining how to make that link, let me start with 
this premise about what is a high performance home, and we can call it a net zero ready home, or we can call it a net zero possible home, or an ultra low energy home, we can call it whatever we want, but for semantics right now, let's call it a high performance home. And I think all of us would agree that the outcome typically for a high performance home is it's much, much more affordable, and it addresses health issues, durability issues, and comfort issues way beyond what we get with a basic minimum code home. And the way we get there first is we address building science. And that's you know, airflow, thermal flow, moisture flow, and uh, efficient components come next. And efficient components are lighting and the water heating and it's the appliances and, it's, you know, and the efficiency of the equipment. Then comes the indoor air quality, which is basically three things. It's controlling the sources of pollutant, you're diluting the remaining pollutants that are in the house, and lastly, filtrating what's left. And then comes disaster resistance. And this one is often missing from most programs that I see. What's, to me, crazy is we do the first three, we are creating homes that will last and should last hundreds of years. Except what would happen if a windstorm comes or a tornado or a hurricane or a flood in a certain flood zone or an earthquake in an earthquake zone? It is, to me, uh, not acceptable to call a house high performance and not have some basic protections that ensure the house will be there for risks that are likely in that location. And lastly, if you're going to do all that, for maybe a three or four hundred dollar incremental cost, if that, you can save thousands of dollars later adding a renewable energy system. And you know, all, renewable energy system is what it is. It's, you know, you buy a house, and that's your house, and then if you want to go in the power plant business, you buy a small power plant and put it on your roof. Now, as Mark's numbers show, essentially, you're in the electron business. You're going to be producing electrons that go to the utility. They'll give you money back. Typically, they'll reverse the meter. And so the reason for having PV is not because the house is healthier or more comfortable or more durable. My goodness, if it comes time to replace a roof, you have a whole issue in your hands what you do with that PV system. The only reason to buy PV is because you want to be in the power plant business. You want to sell electrons, and then you get money back. But truthfully, there's another reason. You want a badge of honor. You want something on the roof that says, we're good guys. So that might be the other reason. But essentially, it's insane to have a house that's so good, and that would have an amazing cost penalty in the future, so that person could go in the power plant business, at when you can just do very simple things, you know, things like you all know, uh, make sure that the roof structural calculations are in place that show a solar system can be added and not have to go through a whole set of structural calculations year eight, nine, or ten in the future when someone puts a system in. Having conduit or piping to run pipes or wiring, have a place to put an extra tank for the solar, or having a place for the inverter, having two circuit breaker boxes dedicated for the PV in the future, uh, having two valves that let you valve off the piping to a solar tank and back without having to do all these extra, very expensive cuts into the piping and so forth. They're not very significant, they're very, very minor, but you can make a house renewable energy ready on the front end, and then the owners know they have a very special house that can go as far as it wants with renewable in the future. Okay, so those are the five pieces. So the airflow, thermal flow, moisture flow, HVAC, source control, weather, pass, and solar electric and solar thermal. So what I want to do before I suggest how we can think about combining Builders Challenge and Passive House is maybe look at how we compare across all these components. So let's first start with the overall performance. The uh, reference design process is what we use with both Energy Star and will be for Builder Challenge. Reference design, the way it works, is uh, it's simply a detailed set of specifications that you put into your software. It yields a score. The specifications are chosen so they're so rigorous, it delivers a very efficient home. In the case of Energy Star version 3, a HERS 70 or better. And in the case of Builder Challenge, at least a 60 or better. We've done analysis so far, it shows more like an average of 55, but the 60 is the target. Okay, when you see red, red means it's mandatory. So those are mandatory, and your requirements for a threshold are the 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and the primary energy of 120 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. So you have those, uh, we have different thresholds. They're all pretty rigorous. 
Now what's very different about us though is this. We address the size issue two ways. What happens is that a HERS score will be much lower or better for a bigger home because that's the way the HERS scoring system works. It looks at metabolism versus total energy and the metabolism rate is shorter or lower for a bigger house with a big shell. So we take the big house advantage away with the reference design because you get a custom HERS score. You run the, uh, the uh, specifications from the reference design, which are simply a set of very, very rigorous features in your software, and the score will vary for a big home, a small home. So wind up that the, you don't get, get that advantage for the big home over the small home. And what also winds up happening is that the Hearst scoring system gives advantages to certain fuels and certain locations and certain types of foundations. All that goes away because you have a custom score where all the same innovations are modeled and that becomes your score. The second way that we take away the size uh, factor is with a size adjustment factor. In addition to taking the size advantage away because of a reference design, what we do is if your house is bigger than what we call a reference or you know, a benchmark home, you have to get more points. And there's an equation that's run in the software, as a matter of fact, that shows how many points you have to do. But let's say you go from a three bedroom, 2200 square foot house, which is the benchmark size for a three bedroom house, to four or 5,000, you need another six or seven Hertz points. So essentially what's happening is your Hertz score is going lower as your house gets bigger. So in Energy Star and build a challenge, you have to do more as your house gets bigger. You don't have that with uh, passive house. Now, we, like you, we don't allow the PV trade-off to get you a basic score, but we allow photovoltaics or other renewable energy to contribute to the additional points you need for the size adjustment. So if the target score for you is before the size adjustments, 60, then you need another 10 points because of the size adjustment. The 10 points additional that you need can come from the renewable energy system. That's the way our system works, okay? And you don't allow a trade-off either for the main requirements of your program. Okay, now the building science. Uh, your air tightness number is a famous number, 0.6 air changes per 50 or less. Uh, for energy star, it ranges from three to seven. And as most of you know, it would be a lower number up north and a higher number down south because air leakage has more impact the further north you go. Where half of the Energy Star would build a challenge? We're 1.5 up north down to three in the south. Now the 2012 IECC is three air changes per hour everywhere. Duct tightness, we're about four CFM per 100 square feet uh, for both programs except uh, build a challenge on top of that says stop the madness, no ducts allowed in unconditioned space. So your ducts have to be inside the conditioned space. 4 CFM per 100 square feet uh, at 25 pascals is about a little bit less than 6% of fan flow, but it varies a little bit depending on house size. And for your program for passive house, uh, it's just the duct, le uh, duct leakage has to be what's required to get to 15 kilowatt hours per square meter. The insulation qu quantity has to be 2009 IACC for Energy Star, 2012 for Build a Challenge, and as required again for the 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year for a passive house. But on, on top of quantity, we have quality requirements. There are detailed checklists that are two pages long that explain how you have to address installation so there are no gaps, voids, compressions, or misalignments, how you have to have complete air barriers, and how you have to minimize thermal bridging. Now, Passive House has a recommendation for thermal bridging free construction less than 0.01 watts per meter. And so that's a little bit different. Windows, uh, the worst window you're allowed to do in Energy Star is, uh, in, um, in, in Energy Star is the 2009 IECC. The reference design assumes Energy Star, so that will be a trade-off you have to do if you want to go lower to a 2009 IECC window. In Builder's Challenge, the reference design is a almost an R4 window, and uh, the worst you can do is Energy Star if you want to trade off against that. Passive House, again, has your rigorous triple glaze window requirement. Oh, recommended. It's not, it's not a specific requirement. 
Water protection, there's a detailed checklist for both Builder Challenge and Energy Star. And in Passive House, that's not specified. And probably the reason I, I can give you is this little demonstration I ask people to do who are more lay audience. I always tell folks who want to understand why we have this very long checklist for water protection to do this. Take a shower, then dry your hair with a hair blower, and time how long it takes for your hair to dry. Then I say, okay, now to finish the experiment, go back and take a shower again, and now dry it this time with a piece of rigid insulation between the hair blower and your hair, and now measure how long it takes. And after eight or nine hours, you'll probably just stop and your hair is still wet, or just it's drying naturally. And my point I'm making is that once you make a wall assembly or construction assembly that tight and that well insulated, it doesn't dry. There's just no grace period. If it gets wet, there are problems. So in fact, even though water protection doesn't save you one iota of energy, it is an energy feature. You can't take a house that tight and that efficient and not have a massive checklist that makes sure there's no way water can get inside your homes, at least if you want to work with mainstream builders like we do. Okay? Your builders are probably doing all this stuff already because of who they are and where you're coming from. But again, you want to cross that schism, you want to go to the mainstream audience at some point, you need controls to make sure you don't have these failures in homes that are doing otherwise incredibly amazing improvements. And so you have to do that. So we have a very detailed checklist for water protection, both in Energy Star and Builder Challenge. Then we come to the next piece, energy efficient components. Um, again, you're basically can do what you need to do to meet the heating requirement, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, and the cooling requirements all built into the primary energy. But for us, we actually have requirements in the reference design for Energy Star or super efficient for Builder Challenge. And uh, then those are trade-off opportunities if you want to go lower. For installation, though, we recognize that the actual performance of installed heating cooling equipment is way less than its rated efficiency. The installation practices in this country are insane. It's like virtually complete uh, ignoring a basic manufacturer requirement. So virtually the manufacturer instructions that come with each piece of equipment are not being followed. So effectively, the warranty, if the manufacturers wanted to go there, does not have to really come into play. Nothing's being installed for the manufacturer requirements. And so the airflow, the refrigerant charge, the static pressures, the room by room airflow, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the entire, the way the ducts are installed, everything is not to manufacture specifications. So Energy Star and Build a Challenge have adopted almost all the ACA quality installation standard. And it's one, well, there's one two page checklist for the HVAC contractor and one two-page checklist for the HERS rater. And the checking flows not just in the HVAC system, the heating cooling system, but the ventilation system. Does it have proper flow in the ventilation system, in the bathroom exhaust fans, and so forth? And the installation is not specified, but again, your homes don't have the same issues ours do because you have such small systems that may often don't have duct systems. Okay, lighting appliances, the reference design, is Energy Star, you don't have to do it, but then you have to make up the trade-off. In Build a Challenge, you have to do Energy Star lighting and appliances, but the lighting's only 80% of the sockets. Yours, I think, is encumbered in the primary energy. Water heating has to be more efficient, but not much more for Energy Star. Uh, for Energy Star, for Builders Challenge, you actually have to use Energy Star qualified water heaters, which are basically heat pump water heaters or solar water heaters or high efficient gas water heaters that are like, uh, uh, I think 0.67 if they're power vented, 0.8 if they're instantaneous. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very efficient water heater. And for water efficiency, we thought now we can't ignore that issue. Now to have a super high performance home that's consuming way more water than it needs doesn't make sense. So uh, Energy Star leaves it alone, but Build a Challenge says, you have to use water efficient fixtures that are qualified for water sense, another EPA label that defines high performance water fixtures. And it also goes for water distribution. Let me give you just one example. There's a device called a demand pumping system. Probably most of you know what it is. Now, in smaller homes, this won't be a big deal, but we see a lot of bigger homes in Energy Star, and it's not like it's not like 
importantly that you would have to wait three, four minutes at some fixtures to get hot water. And that's three, four minutes water goes down a drain at two and a half gallons a minute, six, seven, eight gallons of use. Over the course of a year, it could be six, seven thousand gallons of water going down the drain simply waiting for hot water. There's energy involved in processing and distributing the water, and then there's energy involved uh, in waste heating the water. So going to a water efficient distribution system, which is either a demand pumping system that gets rid of that issue, I won't go into the details for now, or core plumbing, which is having a plumbing layout that has, doesn't have long runs, or manifold systems that are designed with the right size piping, you can minimize that loss, probably improve the efficiency of your water heating system. So we have those things in our spec. And I think right now that's not part of Passive House. Source control dilution filtration for indoor air quality. It's a byproduct partially in Energy Star. In Build a Challenge, there's an uh, indoor air plus checklist program out of EPA that we say you have to do. Virtually two thirds of it's being done by virtue of Energy Star version three. The last third then is being captured by making the air plus requirement part of Build a Challenge. What that's doing essentially is keeping the chemicals out of the board products, the adhesives, the cabinets, the carpets, the paints. It's making sure there's a radon mitigation system in zones that have high risk of radon. You're getting a sense of what's going on is that we're saying the house is this tight and this well insulated, this well built. Maybe we have a responsibility to know the homeowner is not getting a whole boatload full of chemicals. And we know there's a good market case here. In this country, we spend about $40 billion a year on organic food and about $20 billion a year on bottled water. So apparently, American consumers have got the idea that they don't want chemicals in their stuff. Okay? So we think that's a good thing. Right now, we think the biggest issue I can align with Passive House is you do recommend a heat recovery ventilation with 75% recovery rates with low electric uh, consumption. So uh, that piece is there. Okay, disaster resistance is not, for weather, natural events, pests, and so forth, is not addressed at all by Energy Star. And really, Builders Challenge just wants to introduce the concept right now. I think it'd be tipping our requirements to maybe be too heavy for the industry. So we're encouraging people to use a checklist by the Institute for Business and Home Safety. Uh, it's, the program's called the Fortified Home Program. You wind up getting, I think, a 10% discount on your insurance rate if you get that certificate as well. So we'll be promoting that and maybe thinking about if that should be mandatory in the future. And I don't think there's disaster resistance requirements with um, Passive House. If you want a sense, by the way, what it takes to earn the certificate, in a floodplain location, you have to be three feet above the median flood level. In, in zones that are exposed to fire, like a lot of California and the Southwest, you have to have non-combustible materials on the siding and the roof and the decks and so forth. Uh, you have to keep a clearing around the house a certain distance from things that burn. Uh, in earthquake zones, you have to have more hold downs and strapping. And in zones exposed to tornadoes and earthquake, again, uh, more strapping and connector connectors to brace the structure. So you get the idea of what's involved in disaster resistance. And then lastly, renewable energy ready is not addressed by Energy Star. We're requiring the checklists that have been developed by EPA for renewable energy ready, many of the items that I mentioned quickly before, in high solar insulation areas. So the whole Southwest and some other states, maybe just above that, you'd have to be renewable ready. And I think Passive House, most of you guys just assume that's being done as a matter of course, so it's not really part of your spec. And lastly, verification, I won't go through any details since time's running short, but there are a lot of tests, inspections, and verifications by all the programs. Uh, and there's different ways of doing it, but ver essentially verification's being done in all the programs. So build a challenge. What I think we're doing with this program is charting a really good, maybe entry-level path to how you get to net zero and how you get to passive house. We take Energy Star version three as a mandatory requirement. Oh, excuse me. Then we add the Building America technologies that are coming out of that program, and that's you know, ducts inside conditioned space. It's half the air tightness of or air leakage levels of Energy Star, super windows, and super efficient equipment. 
And then we add the water sense indoor requirements. We add the we add the Energy Star, not the Energy Star, the EPA indoor air plus requirements. Then we require the renewable energy ready for PV and thermal in climates with uh, enough solar insulation. We encourage fortified home certificate, and we call that Energy Star Builder Challenge or just Builder Challenge, depending on how this label works out in conversation with EPA. And that's our label. And then we think you're ready for renewable power. Now, how often around the country in our travels for all of us are we seeing PV systems going in homes that are barely above code? Now, just an absolutely silly process. And so I think providing in the marketplace a prudent path to how you get to a ultra low energy home that's ready for renewable systems is something that's really worthwhile. So how does this all compare? Here's Energy Star version three. And if we're trying to get to we're really ready for net zero, we have a lot of building science, we have a lot of efficient components, we're getting a lot of byproduct of indoor air quality, and we don't really have disaster resistance or renewable ready addressed. Then comes build a challenge. And I think we're getting very, very close to where we should be for net zero ready with the building science, the efficient components, indoor air with the complete checklist is in great shape. And I think disaster resistance is encouraged so it has a dotted line. And because renewable ready is so well addressed with that checklist, I think we are obviously renewable ready. And then here's Passive House. I think you're almost at net zero for building science. I leave off a little piece because I like to see the water protection system in the specification. I know, you know, your guys are all probably doing a great job with it, but the spec as it moves to mainstream, I think needs to be more prescriptive about you cannot leave this out because virtually it ensures failures in homes with the amount of insulation and air sealing you have with a passive house. Your efficient components are, are there, I think, by virtue of the primary energy requirements. You don't have the indoor air quality addressed proactively. I think you probably get it indirectly because of who builds your homes. But you know, right now, looking ahead, if you read the specifications, it's not there. And of course, disaster resistance and renewable ready are not in your specs as well. So that's just an observation. So my point is maybe the way we get to some of Mark's concerns about what do we do about having specs that are ready and climate responsive and address different needs and, and give builders a way to do things that are appropriate to the climate can be addressed by having maybe a, 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 some sort of way to partner with Build a Challenge. And it begins, for me, with making Build a Challenge maybe a prerequisite for Passive House. You ensure moisture control without having to go through all the detail changing your specifications. You'll ensure complete indoor air quality without having to change your specifications. You'll ensure water efficient practices, which I think many of you will observe, in this country at least, is a more significant issue than energy in a very, very large portion of this country. And maybe get off being silent on that is a good thing. You'll encourage disaster resistance, which is missing, and you'll ensure renewable energy ready performance. And then, Taking it one step further, why then jointly promote both programs? Well, I think now you have a way to bring builders slowly into your program, much like Energy Star did with a god-awful first spec that got us on the ground and incrementally gave people choices how to get to complete building science. I think there's an opportunity to show Build a Challenge as a prudent way to start working your way to this aspirational goal of Passive House, which is an incredible specification. And you'll increase your outreach to the U.S. housing industry because you have 8,500 builders today working with Energy Star version 3 and Energy Star program. You have another hundreds of builders working with Build a Challenge. You have basic, basically this link that's missing between your program and these other programs, and they're not competing. They're complementary. You know, it's not like you have to do one system and you can't work your way up to the other systems. I think all these programs feed each other. Our competition is that just a minimum code home is acceptable. Okay, that's our competition for all three programs. And all three programs offer different things. So I, I'll leave you today with some action steps and then one very quick um, editorial comment. Uh, I think, let's see, if, make a decision if we should make Builders Challenge maybe a prerequisite for Passive House. 
And if, if that makes sense to people, maybe present it to the board, finalize a policy, and jointly promote the programs. It, it's something I would like to recommend. And before leaving you today, uh, a friend of mine sent me a few days ago this passive house that he just certified. And I, I, I think it's really important to realize that um, you're in the same boat we are, where we want people who see our homes to not think that because you do Energy Star or Build a Challenge or Passive House, that you have to compromise on aesthetics or functionality. And it's not that this home is terrible or anything, but it, it, I think compared to what most American home buyers expect, um, the color scheme's a little bit you know, aggressive. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the yellow-green trim, yellow -green trim's interesting. Uh, the lack of windows facing maybe certain orientations that may still warrant windows because they have a view might be an issue. And the inside without any color and maybe uh, some concerns about potential clutter on day one when this is being inspected. You know, we have to think about how do our homes present themselves so people just don't say, I'm only after the energy performance or the ultra low performance that they also realize these homes don't force compromise. And a big challenge for us, and, and the passive solar movement early 40, 30 years ago faced this big time. The eclectic look really created a very, very difficult transition to gaining interest by mainstream consumers. So just be aware that it's real important to feature a really good design. Design and location still trump everything in my world. Uh, where I'm out there, if you don't have those, I'm not even coming to play. It, it's really important to get all those factors together. So I dumped a lot on you today. I, you, you guys are great and attentive. Thank you very much. <laughs>